a new heaven and the new earth that is promised in your word. And may we understand it today as you teach us by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I mentioned, I've titled our sermon this morning, A Symphony of Joy. Uh, as I was preparing for this morning, I was listening to some classical music. As many of you know that I'm a great fan of classical Western music. Uh, and I mean by that Bach and Handel and Mendelssohn and uh, Brahms, uh, many great classical musicians. And, and what they were able to do in music form, without words, they were able to, able to capture pictures with tones. And you know, whenever you listen to classical music, there are highs, there are lows, there are major keys, there are minor keys, there are sharps, there are flats. And, and it takes you to the mountains and it takes you to the valleys. It takes you into bright lights and it takes you into darkness. And, and it's a beautiful symphony of rising and falling. This is what I could illustrate the passage before us with is that it's like a symphony. It has beautiful tones and there are beautiful pictures that we see before our eyes. And uh, I hope that we capture that today as we study this text together. As we begin, I don't think you really need to be reminded of what is being talked about in this passage by Luke. Uh, women are created with a, a wonderful instinct of loving babies. I mean, I think we would agree with that, that when a baby is, when we find out a baby is going to come into the world, uh, women react in a certain way. They get excited, and, and they want to tell people, and they want to make it known, and they want to know what's coming, and it's, it creates a buzz of life at the anticipation of a baby coming into the world. It's just joyous for everybody. I would also say that there's a, an unspoken rule that for some reason, and it's not as predominant today in our present culture, but for some reason, women just have a natural pass to walk up to another person with a baby and say, may I hold your baby? And usually the answer is, sure, yeah. And then that woman holds and embraces that baby and smiles from ear to ear and pats it on the back and maybe kisses it on the cheek and, 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 and loves that that baby smell, right? And all of you know, probably many of you know what I'm talking about, that baby smell. I'm not talking about a diaper smell. I'm talking about the good baby smell. There's a special thing there. Now, if a man would do that, if a man were to walk up to a woman and say, may I hold your baby? She's probably going to say, no, I, I don't know you. Uh, you're not going to take my baby in your arms and hold him close and kiss him on the cheek. And it, it just, guys don't do that. Now, men, we get excited whenever babies are coming into the world. We love that, but not like a woman loves that. There's a difference. There's a creative intent there. And we see this on display in this story of Elizabeth and Mary. We have to ask ourselves the question, what is this passage teaching us? What is the timeless truth here? Well, as we burrow down into the text, we're going to see that Christians believe the word of the Lord and we rejoice with great joy in the God of our salvation. That's what we're seeing here. There's a maybe a primary principle that's taught in this passage about the work of the Holy Spirit, the pneumatology, for those of you that are taking notes, that's the work of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit. But I think for our time together this morning, we see the importance of God's word to bring, to bring joy in our lives as Christians. Then the question becomes this, as Christians, how does God's word bring lasting joy in the Lord? How important is this book? How, how vital is this word of God to us as believers? Well, I want to remind you that narrative is not normative. What's a narrative? A narrative is a story, right? Gospel narrative is a, is a proclamation of the story of Jesus Christ and what he has done, who he is. But that's not normative for us to practice. What do I mean by this? Whenever somebody gets pregnant with a baby, we're not looking for the next John the Baptist. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
We're not, this is not normative. We're not norm, children are not normally filled with the Holy Spirit. This is a unique miracle that is, that is a narrative recorded for us. It is a story. It's not to be duplicated. So how does, even though we know we're studying narrative, this story teaches us at least three principles that show us how God's word produces great joy in our lives. Here they are. For those of you taking notes, I'm going to give them to you one, two, three, okay? Number one, God's word leads God's people to greater humility. You say, well, that doesn't sound like a joy-producing result. It is. That's where your joy begins, when God applies his word to your life in humility, when you're humbled, when God cuts your pride out, then you experience true joy. Secondly, what we're going to see today is that God's word is applied by his Holy Spirit. That's how God applies the word to the believer, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And finally, what's the result? We're going to see, thirdly, that God's word produces genuine worship. It's God's word that produces genuine worship. You know, we just sang a song a few moments ago that had the word propitiation in it. I've never heard of any other song containing the word propitiation. That is one of the most magnificent words in all the Bible. The satisfying of God's wrath in Jesus Christ. That's what propitiation means, that the Father is satisfied in the Son. That's a joyous word. So I hope that as you're singing the songs as we come together to sing, you're thinking about how the words point to the truth of God's word. God's word produces genuine worship. So let's jump right into it. Number one, joy is God's word leading us to greater humility. Look with me at verses 36 through 38. Behold, your relative, the angel says, the angel Gabriel says that your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month for her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. These verses here serve as that transition period into what we're about to study in the remaining verses, 39 through 45. Gabriel announces these miracles, these two miracles. One is that Mary is going to carry the Messiah. There will be a virgin birth. The other miracle is given to us in verse 36 that Elizabeth in her old age is also pregnant, six months pregnant at 85. That's a miracle, more than likely 85 years old. And the angel announced last week we saw that Jesus, this Messiah, is going to be this this threefold lesson that we learned last time, that he is going to be the sinless Savior. He is going to be the Son of uh, of God. He is going to be the King of Kings. And what Luke does is he begins to bring these realities to fruition and to, to record the eyewitness testimony throughout the rest of his gospel as he's showing us that Jesus is the sinless Savior. He is the Son of God and that his kingdom reigns forever and ever. Those are wonderful hopes for us, truths for us to hang our lives on. And then we read in verse 37 this amazing statement, for nothing will be impossible with God. That's exactly what Abraham and Sarah heard in Genesis 18 when God visits them and says, is anything too difficult for Yahweh? Or in Numbers 11.23 when Moses and the Israelites were crossing the wilderness and the people were complaining about manna. They were saying manna every day, all day. It's manna. Why the manna? God is providing for everything that they need. And what do they do? They're complaining. And then God says in Numbers eleven twenty three, Yahweh said to Moses, is Yahweh's power limited? Answer, no. Now you shall see whether my word will happen for you or not. So there's the promise given to us by God's word and the promise that, that Yahweh is not hindered. He's not limited for nothing is impossible with him. Or we also see by the prophet Jeremiah, God's creative power at his word. In Jeremiah 32, 17, Ah, Lord Yahweh, Jeremiah records, Behold, you have made the heavens, 
and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. It's God who shows mercy. It's Yahweh who shows mercy and loving kindness to thousands. This is amazing. In Matthew 19, 26, Jesus is teaching. He's teaching his disciples about the salvation of the rich. In this, in this teaching that Jesus says, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And then Jesus said to them, with people, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. With man, he cannot save himself. He can't do anything to justify himself. He can't do anything to rectify his lost condition, but with God. It is possible. Jesus is speaking about salvation. Or how about this in Ephesians 3? Paul says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think according to the power that works within us. That's how God works. He's so far beyond us. He's so far. He is incomprehensible. He is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think. It's amazing. So what's Mary's response? Mary's response, as we see in verse 38, what does she say? By the way, she's maybe 14. Young girl. So faithful. So humble. Imagine today a 14-year-old girl gets pregnant. The stigma, the, the conversations, the gossip. It's the same thing that would have happened in ancient times. 14-year-old girl, not married, is pregnant. Mary is humble. Notice what she says, behold the slave of the Lord. That, that word is a right translation. It's doulos, it's slave. It's actually referring to the female slave. She's a maid servant of the Lord. She's submissive, she's willing, she's teachable, she's obedient, she's patient, she's faithful. Are you like that? When God brings something into your life that is totally unexpected and very challenging, do you reply with, behold, the slave of God? Lord, I know that all things are from you, through you, and to you. I'm going to trust you because your word is true. Mary trusts God's plan. Mary is being placed in an extremely difficult and embarrassing situation. She's going to be accused of adultery. She's going to, she's going to what's she going to tell Joseph? The one that she's betrothed to. How's the town going to receive her? By Jewish law, she is legally permitted to be killed. She could be stoned. She's pregnant out of wedlock. What does she say? Lord, I'm yours. I'm your slave. May it be done according to your will. Man, if we could be faithful like that, right? Lord, whatever comes, I'm your slave. I'm your man. Use me to the last drop. Mary believes God's word. Psalm 116, 16 says, O oh, Yahweh, surely I am your slave, the son of your maidservant, whom you have made free. You've set me free, O oh God. You can use me as at your disposal. Whatever comes, wherever you may take me, may I be faithful. Psalm 119, 38, the servant of God is devoted to fearing the Lord. The psalmist says, cause your word to be established for your slave as that which produces fear of you. Or whenever Paul is writing in the book of Romans, chapter 4, verses 20 and 21, Abraham didn't waver whenever God called him to offer his only son Isaac. Yet with respect, Paul says, to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief. Just like Mary and Abraham grew strong in faith, giving glory to God being assured fully that what God has promised, he was able also to do. That's how we live as Christians. When God sends a storm, when God sends a trial, when God sends a test into our lives, we say, God, may it be done according to your word. 
May we receive this as your hand, your perfect hand and your perfect providential will that we may declare Christ to the world, that we may be an example. And then all of a sudden, just like we see all throughout Scripture, the angel leaves, the angel departs, Gabriel's gone. Now, this moves us to our second heading, that joy is worked in us to greater humility according to the word of God. And number two, joy is God's word applied by the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit's work to apply God's word. Notice what happens, verse 39 through 41. Now at this time Mary arose and went in a hurry to the hill country to a city in Judah and entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened that when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she cried out, verse 42, with a loud voice. Now, three things happen. First of all, it's worth mentioning that Mary receives this announcement, and then she travels nearly 100 miles on foot. Isn't that amazing? I remember in high school, whenever I attempted with my brother and a friend to travel 14 miles of the Appalachian Trail. Seven miles in, I thought we were going to die. We were out of water. It was hot. I wanted to lie down and die. And we had seven more miles to go. Mary makes it 100 miles. She travels probably from the 40 miles or so west of Galilee in the town of Nazareth. She travels eastward to the Jordan River Valley, which descends down nearly half a mile. She walks in the Jordan River Valley down to probably Jericho, which is about 80 miles. Remember, she didn't cut straight through Samaria because that wasn't seen as a good practice to do for faithful Jews. When she gets to Jericho, she makes the westward turn towards Jerusalem and Bethany to probably the town of Hebron, which was known as a Levite town. And she's probably out in the country with Zechariah and Elizabeth in this obscure location where Zechariah has been mute and deaf for six months. Isn't that amazing? And whenever Mary walks in the door and greets, we don't know what she says. It doesn't really matter what she says. When she greets Elizabeth, a probably 85-year-old pregnant woman, we read of John the Baptist. The word means thrashing, to, to jump about in the womb. Now, for those ladies who have been blessed with pregnancy, It's an amazing thing when that little baby moves. They used to call it the quickening. They used to call it when you first feel the baby move or kick. It's an amazing, joyous moment for both the wife and the husband. It's a joyous thing whenever you you see your wife go, I I just felt the baby move. But for Elizabeth, it was, oh, ow, whoa. John the Baptist, this word that we read of here with, that happened with Elizabeth is the same word that Rebecca her, used whenever Esau and Jacob were wrestling around in her womb. This is an amazing moment, a miraculous happening. So she heads down. Mary moves probably around 100 miles in her first trimester. She's probably dealing with, I would imagine, morning sickness. An important note begins to emerge here. Of the equal treatment and the special attention given to women found really only in Christianity. In ancient texts, you don't find a clear, loving treatment, let alone recorded words of women, but you do in the Gospels, which shows the equal treatment and value and appreciation given to men, given to women, who have a unique role designed by God. There are some things that men cannot do that women can do, namely having a baby. It's almost ridiculous that I need to even say this. But as this message goes out into the interweb, 
when I say there are only two genders, man and woman, and that's it, I can literally be arrested in Great Britain right now for saying that. It's considered hate speech. When you say that God has designed and created with unique distinction and roles, men and women, today we live in a time that says that's hate speech. When you say that only women can have babies, it's seen as hate speech. We are living in a Romans 1 reprobate world. But what does God's word do for us? Aren't you thankful that God's word anchors our understanding of reality? And it doesn't shift, it doesn't change, it's joyous. When men and women fulfill their duties and their roles, it is a joyous thing because it is life in God's design. So Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. Three things happen here. One, the baby leaps. Two, the baby and Elizabeth are filled with the Holy Spirit. And three, she cries out. She begins to erupt in truth. There should be some teaching clarity here with regard to this filling of the Holy Spirit. We know that as New Testament believers that we are moved by the Holy Spirit in the sense controlled by the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, in which this is also taking place during Old Testament times, that the Spirit of God would abide in the New Testament, the Spirit resides. That's an important note for you to have fixed in your mind. So whenever David says, take not your Holy Spirit from me, in the Old Testament, the Spirit would come upon a person and potentially leave a person. But in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit abide, resides and indwells within believers. Luke 1.15, the promise was given that the Holy Spirit would fill John the Baptist from his mother's womb. In Acts chapter 2, verse 4, on the day of Pentecost, the church was filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts 4, verse 8, Peter preaches filled with the Holy Spirit. Whenever Paul is converted on the road to Damascus, Ananias is sent to Paul to announce to him that he has been chosen by God to be used as an instrument of the gospel, and he is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5, 18 Paul writes, do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. In other words, don't be controlled by alcoholic drink in the sense that an alcoholic drink takes over a person. Be filled with the Holy Spirit that you are moved and carried along by the Holy Spirit according to the word of God. This leads us to our third point. Joy is God's word producing genuine worship. This is quite amazing. As Elizabeth erupts in praise and she rejoices in the Lord, she rejoices that God is the life-giving creator. And this is really important for those of you taking notes. If you were to summarize from Genesis to Revelation the thrust of the Bible... If you were to summarize the, the, the working out of God's plan, you would see it in creation, fall, redemption, and consummation. You would see those four realities played out throughout Scripture. Creation, the fall of man, the redemption of man, and the final consummation of the new heavens and the new earth. And what Elizabeth essentially does here is she blesses God, she worships God for four reasons. And I want to show these four reasons to you this morning. Number one, Elizabeth rejoices in the Lord who is the life-giving creator. Number two, Elizabeth rejoices in the Lord for her salvation. Note verse 43. And how is it that it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me. She says, the one in Mary's womb is God in the flesh, my Lord. This is similar to what David said in Psalm 110, that, that my Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And Jesus is seen as Lord and he is Lord throughout the gospel record. Number three, what does Elizabeth do to, to declare true worship? 
She rejoices in the Lord for his blessings. Do you know this is where your worship, you can come here and worship God for how he has blessed you. Are you breathing right now? Let me ask you that question. The very breath in your lungs has been given to you by the sovereign creator God. And I, we don't think about that, do we? That's enough to praise him for a lifetime, isn't it? To praise God for the very breath in your lungs. And Elizabeth rejoices in the blessings. She rejoices in John the Baptist. She rejoices in salvation and faith and repentance that there's a baby in her womb at 85 years old. Dear ones, if you just think for five seconds, there is a lifetime of blessings that you can render worship for God for. Human life, dear ones, I think I, I have to point this out to you. Human life begins at the moment of fertilization. That's a human being leaping in Elizabeth's womb. The joy of human life in the womb, it, it causes everyone to rejoice. The womb should be the safest place in the world, but today it is the most deadly place to be. We live in a culture of death. 65 million babies since the 70s have been murdered that we know of. Now that the pill has been introduced, we can't even keep track of the numbers of babies that are aborted. Death in the womb goes against every fiber in a woman's body. Listen very closely to this. I know our time is nearly up. I realize that these days are long. Don't miss this. A woman who gets an abortion knows exactly what they are doing. They knowingly take an innocent human life. A woman who kills her unborn child in an abortion, listen closely, she is not a victim. If we continue to label women who get abortions as victims, We've just absolved them from any wrongdoing. And worst of all, dear ones, listen. If their sin of murder is not called sin, we've just isolated them from the life-giving hope and forgiveness found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you label someone a victim, you've just cut them off from forgiveness in Christ. You've cut them off from hope. You've cut them off from eternal life. And then the argument usually goes something like this. Well, what about rape? What about incest? What about the health of the mother? For two of those, we have to answer this way. If you have instances of rape and incest, and that person goes and that woman gets an abortion, you've now become the victim of rape and incest and the mother of an aborted child. Killing the child does not take away the sin of rape and incest. Why compound it? A child has done nothing wrong and it never ceases to be human from the moment of fertilization. And we say, well, what about heartbeat? Let's think about this. A functioning heart, is that the definition of a human? The answer is no, because there are people we know in our lives who have pacemakers and, and AFib. They never cease to be human. Life starts from the moment of fertilization. I want to point something else out, that IVF, in vitro fertilization, has also posed great ethical challenges facing the church today that God's word provides answers to. Particularly, listen close. We have homosexual couples today buying babies, renting a womb, thanks to IVF. Doesn't that cause us to pause at all? Not to mention the hundreds of thousands of babies who are still frozen due to IVF. Would you lock your child up in a prison for the rest of their life? 
he would say, no, that's crazy. That's what's happening right now. As millions of frozen embryos around our... We just read about this in, a, in Alabama, didn't we? This, this clinic had shut down, an IVF clinic, clinic had shut down, and, and hundreds, if not thousands, of embryos were lost. And it posed an ethical question. What do we do? Are those human beings? The answer is, yes, they are. Those are people with a soul that will live forever. And we must treat them that way. The laws that apply to people outside of the womb should also apply to people inside the room, womb. Wouldn't you agree? We see this so clearly in this passage of Scripture. Finally, dear ones, aren't you thankful? As I bring that out, I think it's the tendency of the church to just kind of, they kind of sit back. I just can't get involved with that. I don't know how. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? And are you saying before God, as Mary said, Lord, I'm your slave. Do with me as you see fit. Don't you rejoice today, dear ones? The point of this passage today is to remind us that God's word has the answers, doesn't it? God's word has the answers for us. How we should think, how we should live, how we should live in light of these realities and how we should reach these people with compassion and grace and mercy. God's word has the answers. This entire passage, dear ones, is given to us. If you look at verse 45, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by faith, by the Lord. This entire passage is given to us to show the trustworthiness of the Lord to honor the promises given in his word because the Lord is true to his word. He and we have great joy as we trust in life's greatest challenges that God is going to lead us through by his word. Furthermore, dear ones, as I've just mentioned, life begins at the moment of fertilization and it ends at the moment of natural death. We must constantly examine the scriptures as the only authority of faith and faithfulness in life. Elizabeth recognized that Mary's child is the Son of God, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And dear ones, if you're here today and you have never been converted, I ask you the same statement that Elizabeth said to Mary, I ask you, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you rejoice? Here's a test. Do you rejoice in Jesus Christ? Do you rejoice that he has set you free from the penalty of sin and death to transform you and walk in newness of life? Here's another test. How do you know if you're born again? Do you love his word? Do you rejoice in God's life-giving word? Is the Bible a source of joy for you? Have you been humbled? Have you been humbled by the mighty sovereign hand of God? Are you a servant? Are you serving? Are you a slave? As Mary said, Lord, do with me as you see fit. If that's not you today, if you can't answer yes to those questions, I urge you, confess your sin before a holy God who knows everything about you. Repent of your sin. Look away from yourself. Look to Jesus Christ by faith and find this friend of sinners, the Lord of lords. He came for the sick, not for those who are sinless. He came for sinners. Jesus is the Lamb of God who has come to seek and to save the lost. Are you lost today? Are you looking at all the wrong places for joy when God is saying to you, by his word, look at me. Look at me. Look to me and find joy and find hope and life. Look, stop looking at yourself and look to Christ. And if you're here today, dear ones, and you rejoice in the God of your salvation, like Mary, like Elizabeth, like John the Baptist, we rejoice today because whenever we come to the Lord's table, remember what we're thinking about. When you see the cup and you see the redness of the cup and you see it liquefied before you, you're thinking, 
you're knowing, you're recalling, this is a picture of the blood that was shed for my sin. You see this in your thinking and you're remembering, you're saying, this is, this is a picture of what Christ has done for me. He has been nailed to the tree, his perfect sinless body, his perfect sinless blood shed in my place. When you see the bread, you're thinking about the gospel. You're thinking about his perfect body as an atonement for sin. Jesus the lamb, this precious lamb, this King of Kings. That's what you're thinking. That's what we're thinking about as a family. We're coming together and we're saying, Lord Jesus, I am unworthy. Oh, but how I need you, right? How I need you, Lord. Thank you. If you listen, listen very closely. As you come to the table today, as we come together, can you truly say before Almighty God, Thank you. Thank you for what you've done for me. Father, we are unworthy. We thank you for your word, the treasure that you've given to us. And so often our flesh is weak and we go home and we set our Bibles down and life comes in and distracts. We get pulled in every different direction. We get pulled into reading other things, going to work and studying manuals that will help us earn a paycheck. We run off to soccer practice and dance practice and basketball practice and football practice, baseball practice. We get so distracted and your word sits unread until the next time. Oh God, why do we become so blinded to the joy that is found in your word, the joy that points us to Jesus, the hope of our salvation? Root these things out of our lives, these distractions that, that seek to just totally bring us away from growing in grace and a knowledge of the truth. Forgive us of our flesh and our sin against you. And as we come to the Lord's table, may we remind ourselves and may we be rejoicing in the finished work of Christ as we see the cup and we see and are reminded that Jesus shed his blood for sinners such as I and that he gave his life pictured in the bread, his body as a sacrifice, as the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. May we be reminded of these things afresh and may we have faith to look to Christ alone for our salvation. I pray that you would do these things in us today as you see and picture, as you bring the grace of God by your spirit, as we remember this sacrifice of our Lord together this morning. Bless the hearing of your word. Build your church. In Jesus' name, amen. Dear ones, at this time, I'm going